One little lap. And... There's already stuff on the side. Hey, so I think we might be live now. Um, if you can hear us and see us, then please let us know. Say, uh, say yo, if you can, <laughs> if you can see and hear us. And um, I'm sorry if you were following Zach's uh, live stream, which we just finished on Zach's channel, Zach Evans. Um, then I'm sorry if the sound quality was bad. That's entirely down to my microphone, and it's not liking being near the other things on my desk, unfortunately. Yay! So I can see people saying yo, which means hopefully you can. Um, it, is this sound better than it was on Zach's li uh, live stream? I can't make it a lot better, unfortunately, right now, right here. Uh, but hopefully it's got less interference than previously. It just doesn't, it just interferes with my monitor. So, brilliant. It looks like we're all here. Now, let's have a little look at the questions. So, we finished on the... Um, on Zach's channel with the great question of uh, if you were a knight um, uh, but you had access to a dinosaur steed what would be the best type of dinosaur to ride what's your answer Lucy it's Ankylosaurus which is the only possibly correct answer to that question <laughs> because it's a living tank so and wrong. it has so like wrong. a mace or a flail for a tail which is incredibly cool so I think Ankylosaurus is not a bad choice it's a great choice but where have are you, you gonna... even watched that kids Jurassic Park thing yeah that's but, what he writes uh, but but where do you sit on it just behind the neck but it's quite a small you might fall off the front and then get trampled by your own steed no because mine would be really tame <laughs> so my answer was triceratops because you've got an inbuilt shield you've got horns the whole shebang uh so i think that's the best idea uh right um so let's have a look at some other questions here so um <laughs> you're Gucci. <laughs> Bumpy, yes, Bumpy, Bumpy that's his name. That's right. yeah, what's yeah. that? What? Camp Cretaceous. Camp Cretaceous, yeah. Of the children's programmes, if you have to watch them, the Jurassic Camp Park one is a, is really quite good. Camp Cretaceous is pretty good. It's finished though, I was really sad. It has a cool ending. Had like four seasons, five seasons, yeah. but it did have a good ending, but I kind of hope they'll bring it back. They left an opener. <laughs> they, were, they were clever. Right. Um, oh, so. Jonas Barker has a question which one of the Wakefield Hangar or Rauber Messer, both of which I've reviewed, would you choose to carry for self defence? Oh man, that's really difficult. Which um, ones were they? So do you have them I, to hand? I do kind of have them to hand. Um, so this is actually a prototype, it's not the final one because it's still oh, got the sidebar yeah. on it. So the. Um, Hold on, I'm just trying to balance the microphone. Yeah, I would hold your the, microphone, but yeah. I think from their angle it would look so the best. So that's, that's uh, 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 the first prototype of the Wakefield Hanger. Um, and as you see, that's a fairly, it's a fairly thick and pointy blade. Now this is a slightly meatier sword than the Rauber. Is it the Rauber that I've got? I'm not even sure, can't remember the names. Um, but from Krieger Historical Armoury. And this is the Rauber here, which is a broader and more should we say more choppy uh, more cutty blade, but it's, it's quite light no it's, it's really really light really? yeah um so they've both got equivalent hand protection um oh that's really difficult i think on the battlefield i'd take the wakefield hanger and in civilian life i'd probably take the rauber the rauber's just a little bit quicker and more responsive with a finer edge uh, but worse for thrusting. The Wakefield hanger is a really great design because whilst it's still very effective for cutting, it's got a reinforced point which is more effective for stabbing into gaps uh, in armour and or through mail shirts and things like this. So that's my answer. Battlefield, I'd take the Wakefield. Civilian, I'd take the Rauber. Hit me up with another question. <laughs> which would you take? Of those two... Um, the first one looked like I had better hand protection, but I. But that's in, an early prototype, a, so we. Removed. In a reality situation for home defence, I'd I'd take the one that was lightest. Yeah, 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 which is the Rauber. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, that's the choice. Oh, you've got a super chat, and it says, "Shozbot, 
Are there any historical records of combatants failing at duelling due to poor eyesight, no glasses? Or I'm afraid to say, in? well, thank you very much for your super chat. I'm afraid to say, though, that not that I know of, no. That's um, a really interesting question, though. Yeah, there's, um, so there are accounts from the 19th century of um, officers having particularly bad eyesight and this being a, you've got alcohol. Someone asked if I had port. I'm afraid I did have port. I did not think to get you some. It was probably for the best. Um, you can share mine. Yeah, so Shaz, but um, essentially I don't know of any examples. I'm really sorry. Um, but I do know of examples of people being described as being bad shots due to bad, bad eyesight. Um, I guess in close combat, actually, I mean, I'm, you know, you can see I'm wearing glasses. I'm about minus two. Um, but I can fence perfectly well without my glasses on. So I think if you were m moderately short-sighted um, and long-sighted doesn't really matter too much, I think you'd be okay. Don't you um, find your depth perception is thrown without your... That's so interesting. Not, so I, no. maybe it's my stigmatism rather yeah. than short-sightedness, but if I fence... I've got contact lenses in at the moment. If I fence without glasses or lenses, I'm like... Yeah. I'm miles away. <laughs> yeah, that's the stigmatism thing, I yeah. think. Yeah. Okay, there's another quick question here from Joe. He says, do you know anything about Irish ring pommel swords and have a type XIX blade? Any ideas as to the blade's imported origin? So, yeah, I mean, they're, they're almost certainly imported Italian blades, maybe sometimes Spanish. Um, so the type 19 blade, I mean, you could probably write a book just about the, the, the oak chop type 19 blade. And I love those blades. As it happens... I just happen to have one here, which I actually had for um, Zach's live stream and didn't uh, use it. So this is the LK Chen um, Ribaldo. Uh, there we go. It's quite a long blade, 36 inch blade. But you'll notice this has an Oak Shop Type 19 blade, which has a Ricasso on it. So it was the first dedicated uh, ricasso blade that appears really early, actually, in the early 15th century. And this type of blade, you can find it almost without any change whatsoever, going all the way through the 16th century, all the way through into the 17th century. And in fact, you can still find it in the 19th century on Highland uh, officers' swords, basically. So um, these are usually described as being Italian blades, and we certainly know that there were examples of these being made in Italy. However, if you look at art, some of the earliest examples of fingering swords with this ricasso can actually be found in Spanish art. Um, and by this time, the Spanish were already getting quite famous for making swords, so much so that Henry V, in about 1412, if I remember correctly, uh, imported some Toledo swords to give away as diplomatic gifts. He gave one to the uh, King of Hungary, I think. And, um, yeah, so absolutely, the Type 19 blade, very, very interesting. Some are Italian, some are Spanish, so we could call them Southern European. And they were exported all over Europe, and definitely some of them ended up in Ireland and other parts of the British Isles. Um, now, the ring hilt itself is very interesting, and we don't necessarily know an awful lot about how the ring pommel uh, came about, or indeed the particular S-bend shaped cross guards with the ends that they've got. Um, very interesting. I think someone needs to do more research on that particular style of hilt, uh, because prior to about the middle of the 15th century, um, I don't think we really know where they come from. It's similarly the case with 14th and then 15th century Scottish swords, particularly Highland Scottish swords as well, with the um, the upswept, should we call, uh, crossguard and distinctive style of pommels you sometimes find on those. So it's very interesting that just within the British Isles you have a distinctive Highland Scottish style of hilt already in the 14th century and then you have a distinctive Irish style of hilt already in the 15th century I'm not sure if it goes into the 14th um, and these continue so kind of culturally distinct almost tribally um, sort of patriotic styles of hilt associated with different areas even the lowland Scots had had their own styles of two-handed swords when we get into the 16th century so um, yeah interesting to see that uh, and, and someone, I mean, that would be a fantastic, it would be a PhD for someone, no doubt. Really interesting topic. Awesome. Well, I see that. have had so another super chat. You have to answer <laughs> super chats first. CJM said, how were British sword systems from the 16th century onwards using back edge of double-edged swords? 
Sorry, can you scroll back to that? I was still... <laughs> you were still reading the other question, weren't you? So, in other words, how much did they use the yeah. back edge? Or in what way did they use uh, it? That's difficult. Um, so, if we look at silver... So, actually, we have a silver expert uh, sitting Not in here. the two-handed sword <laughs> bit. I don't remember that uh, well, No, no, that's just British systems. So, um, so, it's any sword. So, does silver ever make hmm. any explicit use of the back edge i don't remember not explicitly no no i'm Um, sure that there are several people who would argue with me but to my memory i can't think of any explicit example of the back edge equally if we look at sweatnam um who's using long bladed single uh single hand swords and also rapiers um as well as basket hilted short swords um i don't remember him ever using the back edge now, for the 19th century, Hutton does use the back edge uh, for the coup de Jarnac and using it on the back, back of the, of the neck, neck. Um, which Lucy also teaches from yeah. the swordsman, so the section uh, How to Fight an Uncivilised Enemy. Yeah, there um, are two very, very clear examples in that, but, but that's yeah. much... Yeah, but so so and, and equally we know that it was done in sabre syst- in certain sabre systems. Most famously, the French uh, did some of it. The manchette and Sir Richard Francis Burton covers that. Um, he has a section on the manchette in his book, uh, but his influence isn't necessarily British sabre. It's more French sabre with a bit of Italian thrown in. Um, so overall. I would say that what we know about British systems, and you could look at the Georgian era, the 18th century backsword, and you could look at the uh, Napoleonic era sabre and spadroon, they basically don't use the back edge. So you could say the British were a bit crap at using their back edges <laughs> from the 16th century all the way through to the 19th century. Yeah. So even though, even on 19th century military swords, they tell you to sharpen the false edge, uh, and we see this on the antiques, this is primarily to assist the thrust not as far as we can tell to really assist with back edge cuts. Even if they're occasionally dealt with in the treatises, it seems that not many people actually did it. I saw a question there about the F thirty five. There we go. Yes, an F thirty five B. Where you're dipping down to. Um, yes, I do like the F thirty five. I find it a fascinating plane. Um, What's so fascinating about it? Oh well, there are so many things that are fascinating. I'd say because it it's really small. <laughs> so in a nutshell. Um, I find the F-35 a very interesting platform because of its upgradability and, uh, and the fact that, you know, it was I got a lot of bad press uh, about 10 years ago because of how it performed quite poorly in some es- essentially simulated dogfights. But the fact is, it was never really built to be a dogfight. If you want a dogfight, you use an F-16 or, or a, um, a Typhoon. It wasn't built for that, um, and I find it a very interesting weapon, weapon platform because it doesn't matter whether we're talking about medieval knights on horseback or whether we're talking about uh, fighter jets. Um, a lot of the common gr- sort of uh, contest between technology and tactics have the same theory behind them, and I find it all very, very fascinating. Essentially trying to prepare for the next war based on the experiences of the previous war which means that most armies and air forces and navies are often not prepared for the next war because they're still planning to fight the last war and it won't be like that. I just realised that question was actually relevant to military history. Yeah, because all military history is the same. I think planes is the topic planes. Yeah. um, For those of you who know him, uh, my my good friend um, Alex, known as Drakenefell, we have a lot of conversations about the new... Uh, 6.8 millimeter um, rifle round being adopted in America, or being proposed to adopt in America um, uh, under SIG's kind of guidance. And this is a fascinating topic that we might do a collaboration video on. I think you probably should. (laughs) Um, There's a really cool question here from William Knight. Good name. Are there any good books on the late medieval and earliest modern sword industry, trade workshop organization, different guilds involved, etc.? I don't know. I don't think so. No, I mean... That would be an interesting book, though. Um, Write it. So, what there are... There, there have been lots of uh, articles written in journals. Um, the Royal Armouries um, has a very good annual journal. I think it's annual. might be a couple of times a year. And also, what used to be the Park Lane Arms Fair um, journal, which came out twice a year were fantastic so park lane stopped now unfortunately um so you might find articles written 
on that particular topic, but I'm not aware of any books which have covered that entire thing. The only thing that you might find of particular relevant interest is um, The Night in the Blast Furnace by Dr. Alan Williams. Uh, Dr. Alan Williams, he's been on my channel. He works for the Wallace Collection um, and uh, he's done a lot of stuff with Toby Capwell. And he specifically has researched uh, for that book, Armour. Uh, manufacturer uh, manufacture. however that's strongly tied to blade manufacture because the blast furnace and the technology that came after that um, uh, and before that in fact is very strongly connected to what types of sword blades were made in Europe at, uh, 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 in different centuries and um, what type of sword blades you can make uh, so, for example, a lot of times, and I've tried to touch on this in the channel, but a lot of times when we talk about one sword versus another sword in terms of which is better or which is worse for different things, say like a Viking era sword and a 17th century rapier, we have to bear in mind that the technology is very, very different. And a, an 8th century sword is made with pattern welding and, and you know, welded on edges. And a uh, 17th century rapier blade is made of very good almost homogenous uh, carbon steel um, and you couldn't necessarily make a rapier in the 8th century with the technology they had available to them. Sorry, so I was just asked whether all the walls in our house are white and I'm just trying to work out almost all of them, yes. Well it's not actually They're, white. It's, it's, <laughs> it's actually like it's got a, it's got a name but, but I think almost all of them are. Yeah, they're slightly... We like, yes. we like the clinical look. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, so Vlad Freeman has asked a question that Matt will answer very carefully because it has pissed off YouTube and other people's um, uh, what they called channels. Oh in right, the past. Yeah. He says I'm. I've been curious how well modern body bulletproof armor fares against blades. Um, any chance you've done tests? Matt very carefully answered this question without getting your channel in trouble. <laughs> So, so in a nutshell, I have to say I don't, I don't really know. So I have never Good. owned. Well, I've never owned any bulletproof um, armor. Well, or I've never owned any armor that was sold as bulletproof armor. I'm sure I own some armor that happens yeah. to be bulletproof. At least it um, has some bullets. Yeah, because ultimately, you know, there are some steel breastplates which will stop a nine millimeter pistol round. But um, I don't know the answer. Basically, um, however. Um, I think that there's some the problem with myth busting so the problem with so a lot of people think I mean you guys probably a lot of you out there will know a lot more about this topic than me but there are assumptions made about uh, modern body armor and what it will and won't stop and very often something that will stop a pistol won't stop a rifle because of course the energy uh, involved is vastly different you know might one might be um, uh, 800 joules and the other might be 2000 joules so clearly some body armor is made to stop shrapnel and pistol bullets and and some uh, and that armor might not stop rifle bullets um, this is true of Kevlar helmets I believe anyway um, the fact is that most blades can't deliver anything like that amount of energy however as I mentioned in a recent video I did stabbing a piece of steel plate, a bullet squishes and fragments and does all sorts of things on impact that a blade doesn't do. A blade stays in one piece usually, and as you see, you might get a bit of a bend or a curl at the end of the blade. So sometimes a low energy hard weapon can penetrate, like an arrow or a crossbow bolt, can penetrate something that a high energy thing that fragments on impact can't penetrate. And this connects actually to Todd's arrows versus armor tests. And something I'd like to see tested, and hopefully Todd and, and Will Sherman and the rest of the team will be able to do this in the future, is testing different types of arrow where the shaft and the socket is made in a way to, to reduce the chances of it breaking as much as possible. Because something I noticed was that the arrows that penetrated plate were the ones where the socket didn't burst. And I feel that what we're getting is different results, not necessarily based on the always the poundage of the bow or the weight of the arrow or the hardness of the head, but sometimes purely how strong's the socket. 
because on the moment of impact the socket was fragmenting a bit like a bullet and if the socket fragments at the moment of impact all your energy is lost it's not going to penetrate anything whereas if the socket stays together if it was brazed for example remember those sources I cited about brazed arrows if the socket is brazed solid so it can't burst you're going to get more energy into the plate just going to throw that out there so I'd like to see that tested I, I and I've you know I've told this I've said this to Todd and Will and in fact we're, I'm going to do a video at some point I need to get on it actually and do a video with Will about arrows and arrowheads so anyway that was a long and wordy answer that went into lots of other um things but I feel that you deserved a more full answer <laughs> but the fact is that I don't I've never owned any bulletproof armor so I've never tested it but I suspect that I couldn't put or me or anyone else couldn't put any blade through that stab vests however we're not uh, going to talk about well, I'm <laughs> purely going to say Jorg Sprav did some tests on stab vests and it, his channel got temporarily thankfully um, shut down because of the daily the, the daily mail not liking it basically um, so I'm not going to get into that topic here <laughs> so um, well we have a super chat that's come in um, Shosbot says, would a modern Warhammer benefit from using depleted uranium for weight, <laughs> maybe laminated with something to prevent contamination? So, Shosbot, I would say no. <laughs> because, Next question. Well, no, because, you know, the only advantage to the dep depleted uranium is um, weight. Yeah, it's mass. That's why, as my understanding, that's why they use them in the cannons on Apache helicopters and stuff like that and um, A-10s and things like this. So... If you want to add more weight to a Warhammer, it's actually really easy to add more weight to it because the problem with a shell or a bullet is you can't make it any bigger to fit through that calibre. So you want the maximum amount of weight in the same amount of volume. But with a Warhammer, you could just make it bigger. So if you want to make it heavier, you just use lead weight or you just make a big... Remember Gendry's Warhammer from Game of Thrones? Do you have a Warhammer in here? Uh, no, I don't have a Warhammer in here. I have a wall hammer in, in, in <laughs> the garage. But, but not um, in here anymore. So making whoops, I guess the microphone. Making the um, <laughs> making the Warhammer heavier would just make it more sluggish to use. So what I would say if you wanted to make a modern Warhammer more effective than a medieval one, look at the hardness of the material and how sharp it is. Adamantium. <laughs> Adamantium, if you can get it. Um, <laughs> it's if hard to come by. If you can make a, uh, or if you can make some kind of trade deal with uh, Wakanda to get some of their, um, uh, what's the stuff that Wakanda has all of the, uh, what was the material? It's not adamantium, is it? It's the no, other that's one. that's what Wolverine it's, it's the thing that Captain America Shield oh, fuck, is made that's of. that's so annoying. Um, oh, Don't I've look at the screen, we'll, we'll I've, remember it. I've got the name of it. Anyway. So making something super hard, but we could do that with the technology we have without having to go to Wakanda. Uh, a diamond, okay? So I would say, what about a Warhammer head that's made of tungsten with a diamond tip? <laughs> that would be what I'd have. A diamond tip. Vibranium! Thank Vibranium. you! <laughs> We're going to shout that. Thank you very much. Vibranium! Vibranium! so yeah. annoying. We only watched that other movie Vibranium, the other day really as well. Good. And constantly watching it. Unobtainium, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, yeah. So I now want, I now want Todd to make me uh, a titanium... Diamond tips. Vibranium adamantium. Um, there is a Todd-based question here. Hang on. Um, Joe says, thanks for the reply. Is Todd Cutler a one-man operation or does he have a few people working for him? It baffles me how um, he makes that much stuff. He is the master craftsman, but he does outsource some of the stuff now because he makes a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't... I don't feel comfortable necessarily <laughs> talking knowing everything i know about todd's yeah, business but, on my he, channel, but, he, but he has yeah he has he has a number of yeah. of employees yeah yeah i mean there's uh, i think about eight or ten people working for the business maybe but um, they are his things yeah, yeah yeah and he's got apprentices and that kind of stuff yeah and they are awesome and you should go and buy all his stuff <laughs> uh raven's big forge says did you get chickens we do have chickens yeah, yeah, they we are do. probably uh, Matt's favourites of all our huge number I of animals. I love actually. our chickens because what they other animal just brilliant. that we could have in our garden can provide endless amounts of food? It's amazing. Not only are they charming animals and very nice, they are charming. I've always liked birds, yeah. and um, 
they're pet dinosaurs aren't they they're the closest you can get to pet dinosaurs and um and they they provide us endless amounts of eggs and i don't know how many of you out there know this but in the uk at the moment due to various <laughs> reasons yeah people can't get hold of tomatoes uh, eggs various other things uh, but we've got eggs galore we've got more eggs than we can eat basically i'm almost there, living on eggs. there are now. too many eggs here but um yeah uh, but I am a bit worried about this bird flu, and I heard that in Cambodia they're saying that bird flu's transferred to humans now. No, it's just bullshit. Don't worry about it. Fingers so crossed. Fine. Oh God, not the no, next, not the next pandemic. Just, we're not doing pandemics anymore. <laughs> okay, where was the next cool question? Not saying that all the questions aren't cool. <laughs> that was more of a monologue than a question. Hang on. Have either of you, Free State Fellow, have either of you done Tulwa slash Pulwa fencing in your clubs, either as a solo weapon or with a shield? Um, I have never taught Tulwa. I do like Tulwa. So they're nice to hold. No. but So, so we, we've cross-trained with um, Shasta Vidya and Gatka people a num- great number of times. Um, I, I, we used to um, do... I mean, at early fight camps, we had a Gatka uh, club used to come and do a demonstration, and then we used to spar with them. And uh, I know various people who who did and still do uh, Gatka. Similarly, we have a regular instructor who comes to both of our events, skirmish and fight camp, who's, uh, that's um, Asante, call out to Asante if you're watching, uh, who teaches Shasta Vidya, so, which is another... A, you know, tradition, um, uh, another, uh, yeah, lineage essentially of uh, Indian martial arts. So, no, not directly, but sort of tangentially, I guess is the answer. Um, um, I would also say that for me personally, I don't see a huge difference between medieval European sword and buckler and Indian sword and buckler. I think anyone who does some Bolognese or I-33 sword and buckler and went and did some Indian sword and buckler, I think, would find sort of eighty, well, maybe not eighty, but maybe, maybe, yeah, sixty or seventy percent similarity. Um, I think the main difference is that, as far as I've seen in Indian martial arts, the sword and the buckler are used separately more of the time than they are in European sword and buckler. A lot of people here agreeing with us about chickens being dinosaurs, which I approve of. Um, and very sadly, Orbiton in the super chat says, "Please don't mention chickens." Mine oh just no! Got raccooned. I'm just we're pressing F. Yeah, got it. Pretending to press F because if I don't know what <laughs> we I, don't know what I have no idea on this stream sucks. after what I'm actually so happens sorry. if I press F. So yeah, but um, yeah, that would suck, and that's obviously something. We have foxes here and mm. um, things like weasel, run, weasels and stoats and well, mm. badgers. and So theoretically, um, our badgers could be... Our badgers. <laughs> our pet badgers. We our, don't our have chicken. pet badgers. Don't even pretend to have yeah. badgers. Um, yeah. The laws about badgers are quite... Uh, yeah. Watch Clarkson's Farm if you want to know about badgers. Uh, but yeah. Um, uh, Davina Duckworth says, have you guys checked out the dueling video game Hellish... Cut recently. I have not checked out that. Yeah, so I've done a video for. Um, who did I do it for? Uh, it was for um, IGN. Uh, it was, I think it was the first IGN video I ever did. Actually, that it was game? on Hellish Cart. Yeah, I do not know that game. So, well. so full disclosure, I still haven't played it, um, which is really, really bad. Uh, they is it a PC game? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah I, I can, don't play. Pe- I, I think I you can. I think it's free download, games. and yeah, but it's it, it looks really cool, and I know they've updated, and, and in fact, the devs are also HEMA people, and they have been in contact with me, and um, yeah, maybe I'll do something on Hellish Cart in the future, but I still haven't played it, which is why I haven't really spoken about it anymore. But it's a really, really cool concept. Um, yeah. Jordan Thomas says, have you heard of the group from Germany that fight with sharp swords and wear no armour other than helmets? They have a YouTube channel. Oh, yes. I think everyone in Hema's heard about them. Uh, yes. So do you know what? People make their own choices. Ultimately, yeah. <laughs> Ultimately I kind of don't care what consenting adults want to get up to uh, in, their, in, in the privacy of their own forest or homes or whatever. However, this is, this is the problem with that group. They are going to get labelled as Hema and they are going to get HEMA blacklisted. They're going to get uh, HEMA. Um, no insurers will want to insure us. 
venues won't want to hire out their halls to us. This is the problem, okay? So these guys are, insert whatever line of expletives you want to here, because essentially they've allowed it to be publicised. They should have just kept it private. I don't care what they do to each other with blades. If that's their kink, then, you know, get on with it. But by putting it on the internet and it getting out there and them allowing that to happen, the problem is, is they're tarnishing everybody else with the, with the stupid high-risk... Um, you know, I think thing it that has the doing. potential to do that, but I think the likelihood of people assuming that what we do is that is actually quite slim. You've got to bear in mind that, particularly in the UK, we we live in a world where because one nutter with a samurai sword decides to assault a, a, an MP or a policeman, that all curved swords are suddenly banned. You know, that's the world we live in. It's a knee-jerk world, and I'm sorry, but it only take look at what happened to Jorg Sprav's. Um, channel just because of the Daily Mail because he made one video testing out a dagger on some you know on something you, we cut it's it, it, it I guess initially it didn't I just kind of thought oh what not I watched it and I was like wow what idiots and it wasn't even like they were good fences or anything they were just basically consulting adults who wanted to hurt each other but the problem is it's too close in the public's mind it's too close to what we do and it's just going to screw us over if someone like the Daily Mail or you know someone else decides to make it into a thing because it's a quiet day at the at the press office. You have strong feelings about this. Well, yeah, because it could that. absolutely. I mean, it could literally get us banned. You know, it, it so will, it'll be fine. Anyway, CJM says, "What are the pros and cons of chariots versus regular cavalry?" Wow, um, or cavalry, if that's your kind of word. Cavalry. <laughs> How to enrage Matt? Um, well, I mean, the the obvious pro of a chariot is that you can have multiple people in one vehicle, um, and so so you can have one person driving around and manoeuvring, and the other person can be shooting or throwing things, um, and you know that's what the Egyptians did. So Egyptian chariots, you know, I did a video recently about Egyptian weapons, um, and. But that, there's some implication. In fact, I've had some very interesting discussions with a um, university um, lecturer um, in the aftermath of that video, and uh, and I've learned a lot from. So uh, thanks to her, um, there are some suggestion that the Egyptians sometimes had more people in a chariot. We know that the Hittites um, <coughs> sometimes had more horses and more people. Um, so you could have multiple people in a large chariot, but that would mean the chariot would be heavier and therefore it would move more slowly. The Egyptians seem to have generally gone for two quick horses and a very light uh, chariot with suspension so they could move very, very quickly around. And usually the person who wasn't driving would be shooting. Um, so that's the advantage of a chariot, I guess. Um, the advantage of cavalry is they are going to be proportionately faster um, and you can have more of them because clearly building chariots is resource heavy. You've got two people in each chariot and you've got two horses in each chariot. So, you know, for every one chariot, you could have at least two cavalry, possibly three cavalry. Um, so, yeah, I guess you could have more units. They're more flexible, more manoeuvrable. They can go over more types of terrain. Horses can go up, you know, up hills, down hills, across rivers and things like this, which chariots can't do. So cavalry far more versatile. Uh, chariots and pr better protection and potentially harder hitting maybe if you use them in frontal assaults which I think the Hittites did uh, so there we go <laughs> um, so Lord Seth Taggart has asked where our eggs come from I assume you I mean they come from chickens but are you asking <laughs> where the chickens that, so. that laid the eggs came from is this a genuine question um, so for anyone who doesn't know, so hopefully most people watching this channel know about the birds and the bees. Where, <laughs> when two where, chickens yeah. love each other very much. <clears throat> when two chicken, but with chickens, this is the amazing thing. You don't need a boy chicken. They just make eggs. And in fact, you don't want a boy chicken. Well, at least we don't because they wake you up in the morning. But also they fertilise the eggs so you get lots of baby chickens, which is not what we want right now. We're just not ready for that level of commitment. Um, well, you know you can eat fertilised eggs. You just don't. You could, them yeah, or put them under a a yeah for, I don't know. But anyway, I kind of, I don't you know. You know, all the eggs from my mum's chickens are fertilised. Really? Oh, well, yes, anyway. But, they're, they're but don't, they don't 
start developing until but then. But for anyone who doesn't know, ages. chickens, hens, female chickens just produce eggs just by themselves. It's like yeah. magic. So, They're like so, magical some animals. Some breeds are more sort of um, <coughs> more numerous in their eggs <coughs> than others. But yeah, we have we just have four chickens, and on average, they each lay one egg a day. Davina Duckworth says V T O L vertical takeoff and landing. Vertical. What does the O stand for? That is Both. not an acronym I know, I'm afraid. It's uh, Harrier jump jets were VTOL, and uh, the F 35B is as well. Yeah. Yeah, so the F 35 is, is a very interesting thing. Because oh, wait, I see, okay, <laughs> right. <I'm> with... <laughs> Wasn't quick enough there. I was like, what are you talking about? Um, Josh Lopez says, Would a knight or man at arms bring spare arms and armour when on campaigns? Yes. <laughs> there you go how much spare we don't know it depends how wealthy they can. yeah it depends how wealthy they were I assume someone else carries it for assuming them. they were reasonably wealthy we know that um it was fairly commonplace for people to have different helmets for different purposes probably other interchangeable parts for their armor as we go into the 16th and 17th centuries, this was referred to as a full garniture. So armourers would produce a whole set with in different arms, different shoulders, sometimes different breastplates or a breastplate and a brigandine, different helmets for different purposes. So if you were in a siege, if you were in a battle, if you were on horse, if you were on foot, if you were fighting at sea, you'd have all these different options like modular that you could swap in and swap out bits for a particular circumstance. Really, really interesting. Uh, my friend Gavin and I have the same attitude to our armours and what we're doing with our armours, that we want different things that we can change in and out for different situations. Uh, hence, I have a brigandine and I have a cuirass, but I can wear all the rest of my armour with the brigandine or obviously with the cuirass uh, for different situations, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's... Um, uh, different bits of armour and also different weapons as well because obviously remember if you're fighting on horseback you would want a lance which you're not going to use on foot usually you might swap out for a, a spear shorter spear or a pole axe um, you might have different swords and this is spoken about by people like Pietro Monte so you might have a, a long sword or a two-handed sword you might have a short uh, arming sword and you might have another you might have a spare sword as well uh, you might have a walking about in the evening sword um possibly possibly spare daggers um and certainly multiple lances as well sorry i was reading i don't <coughs> hear the end bit um john gus says do you have any advice for a novelist who's passionate about hema for including more accurate presentations of weapons techniques etc in fiction uh, in my opinion what all you need to do is just not write about things that you don't know. I think that's where people fall down is, is, is in putting in descriptions of things that they're not actually familiar with. So if you don't know in your head how a technique would play out, just don't describe the intricacy of that particular thing. But I think it's almost a case of more detail is worse in... Um, I read quite a lot of, um, of fantasy or extended <coughs> when I had any spare time. And yeah, it's when they get bogged down in describing stuff that they don't understand that it all goes horribly wrong. Just, yeah, that's my view. <clears throat> yeah, and you know, talking more uh, generally about uh, weapons and equipment, one thing that I feel doesn't get covered enough in um, in literature is the uh, maintenance and damage to arms and equipment and armor. And if you look at Zach Evans's channel, for example. Um, talking about you know the kind of things that reenactors go through so all of their equipment needs to be maintained the whole time you know swords when they get used if they get used if they don't just sit in their scabbard they get they get damaged you've got to clean them you've got to keep them away from damp if they do get used in a fight you might have edge damage that needs to be removed sometimes if you've got certain types of edge damage you cannot put the sword back into the scabbard until you've removed the burring or whatever on the edge. Um, something like a lance or a spear, it might get damaged in combat such that you wouldn't really want to use it again until it had been fixed, until it had a new shaft. Um, armour, leather straps and points 
often, well not often, but occasionally break. Um, and bits get lost as well. That's the other thing, you know, archaeologists, where do all their finds come from? The majority of archaeology finds are either things that were deliberately buried or things that were accidentally lost. Um, so any, you know, army on the move or just people camping, they leave signs behind. They leave bits, you know, a button that pops off, a, a buckle, that, you know, a strap buckle that breaks, this kind of thing. So... Yeah, thinking about wear and tear and maintenance, sharpening, um, how you carry things. How do you transport things? This is something I've spoken about in videos as well. You can have the best armour in the world, the best weapons in the world. How are you transporting them? When you're attacked at night, unsuspectingly, by those goblins, well, you're not wearing, you're not sleeping in your armour, are you? Uh, or if you are sleeping in your armour, you're going to be very fatigued and probably with some backache the next day. So that should be featured as well. Um, so, you know, where do you keep things? How do you keep them? How do you transport them? In that action scene, how do you get to the thing? What are the problems? You know, is your sword stuck in the scabbard? Um, is it in the wagon so you've got to run to the wagon to get it? Uh, this kind of thing. Yeah, these little details. They add to the world building believability, I think. And things malfunctioning, things going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, you've got a couple more super chats. Uh, the first one is from Free State Fellow. It says, your channel is very expensive to watch. I've now got things on order from Kailash and Free Historical. <laughs> Yay! Thanks for the wonderful content. Oh, you're very, very welcome. And both of those manufacturers, I, I can't recommend highly enough. I, I've only got one thing from Krieger Historical. But I have many friends who have other things from Krieger Historical. Maybe at some point I'll be able to review those as well. And everything I see from them, I really, really like. I really like what they're doing. Um, and um, I know they do some cool custom work as well. And Kailash, um, I mean, honestly, I just... I've actually got a, a whole bunch of, what, five of their cookeries sitting on a chair behind us over there. It really does. Yeah. Um, I love their stuff so much um, that I'm going to be doing some more stuff with Kailash in the future, so watch out for that. Apparently the chicken question was a quote from Forty Towers. Oh. I don't know that quote. <laughs> oh. I thought I knew every line of every episode. But there are so many episodes. I know. There's like only 12, I think, aren't there? I now require you to input the entire section that I have missed. We do so actually know Forty Towers pretty well. How do we not know that? So I just, I do apologise for missing how a very important How did we not know reference. that? Um, oh, short takeoff vertical landing. That's it. Yes, because it can do forty-five degrees, or yes, or ninety. Yeah. There's a few questions here about whether we can have a dog when we've got chickens. So we don't have a dog at the moment, but as a lot of people have said, it's entirely possible to have both a dog um, and chickens. They just need to be trained and, and raised and socialised in the right way that they don't harass them, and then you have some barriers. There's a good question here. Why choose a brig over a cuirass? Why choose a brigandine instead of a cuirass? Quite simply, comfort. Okay, uh, comfort and flexibility, which I guess are the same thing. Uh, however, they can be applied in different ways. Obviously, if something's more flexible, it's more comfortable, but also if something's more flexible, you're probably a little bit more uh, nimble in combat and less prone to fatigue. A cuirass offers ultimate protection you can have someone joust at you with a lance into your middle of your breastplate and it shouldn't hurt you probably won't even i mean you'll feel you were hit but you won't feel it on your body you'll feel it by the momentum um you can have someone shoot arrows into you confidently with a cuirass not so confidently into a brigandine Obviously, some brigandines, as Augusto, uh, Magister Ar Armorum will say, were proofed against arrows, but therefore, by implication, some brigandines were not. Um, so, essentially, it's, it's, it's a bit like tanks and armoured fighting vehicles, isn't it? Do you go for maximum protection, but also, therefore, probably slower, more cumbersome, more expensive? Do you go for something which has got more flexibility, lighter, less fatiguing? And so, personally... Um, I love the look of the cuirass, and if I want maximum protection, I wear the cuirass. If I want the experience of fighting in, in full armor, I wear the cuirass. If I was having to spend an entire week during a siege doing useful things like loading artillery or firing a crossbow, sorry, shooting a crossbow, then I'd wear the brigandine. 
Good go. answer. Fantastic. Um, Lee McGee has sent another lovely super chat. He says, hi guys, I hope you're well. Are there any specific mentions by Victorian officers or soldiers of being trained or influenced by Alfred Hutton or wait? Thanks and take care, Lee. Um, yes. Really? Um, awesome. And I'm actually working on a new article for the Eastern Antique Arms website at the moment on that very topic. <gasps> Mic <Mike> drop <laughs> and leave. Literally, it's half written um, and it's... Um, uh, yeah, it's half written and half uploaded, but not published yet. Um, so, a hundred percent, we know that there were numerous um, Victorian officers who were influenced by the works of Alfred Hutton. Specifically, they even cite him; they mention him. Wait, yes, we do. Um, although that's more related to um, tangential research I've done. So I know someone who was a uh, so one of Waite's sort of senior students was a uh, army doctor who served in Afghanistan, if I remember correctly, and he went on to continue teaching after Waite died. Um, so yes, absolutely, and um, we know that we know that serving officers trained at Waite's rooms, as they were widely known. They were a very popular um, training venue for sword bayonet and boxing um, boxing was done by ned donnelly and also wait himself and wait edited ned donnelly's boxing book um so and we know hutton also as well as making books on bayonet and, and sword stuff we know that he trained um hutton trained people in the um uh, Cameronians when he was in India in 1862 and so uh, Hutton's very first book or pamphlet was written for his regiment while he was stationed in India so yeah we absolutely 100% know that both Waite and Hutton directly trained army personnel and uh, influenced them definitely through their writings and also through their classes and they were cited, um, and this will feature in my upcoming article, by um, real frontline Northwest Frontier serving officers, uh, in this case, officer, major, who actually cites Hutton. Um, so, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Um, you have another <clears throat> super chat from Pave Low John, who says, have you ever done a video looking at 17th century fighting structures such as fig? Keep up the good work. Love your videos. <coughs> we used um, to do figs. We knew someone who used to do stuff to do with figs. Oz, yeah. Oh, is it Oz? Oz? Yeah, it's Mr. Martin Ostwick. <laughs> oh. uh, so the, 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 the ba basic thank you. Someone thank you very <laughs> much for your super chat. Yes. Um, Pave Low John, thank you. Does that you. mean I've done some fig? and just not remembered it wasn't no. it pugilism fig so as i understand it we don't actually have any writings of fig remaining but was fig pugilism stuff or am i misremembering fig was did he was a stage gladiator if i remember correctly okay. so he did back sword stuff boxing mm. the whole thing okay so he could have done <clears throat> um now so i haven't really done a video as far as i recall i've never done obviously i've done about two thousand videos now but i don't recall no. ever doing a video on that topic yeah Whoa. um but um and so fig is also 18th century <coughs> rather than 17th century i think isn't fig early 1700s but anyway um I haven't done a dedicated video on Fig or his associated people. Do you know enough about Fig to do so? Uh, probably, yeah. But I'd, I'd probably do, you know, I'd research and I'd dig up some more stuff or maybe do it as a collaboration with Oz, for example. Um, I'm sure he'd be happy to do that. But yeah, a very interesting period. So for anyone who doesn't know, I, I mentioned the phrase stage gladiators. So I imagine a lot of you watching this will, won't know what I mean by that. Just to fill you in, um, in the late 17th and 18th century in uh, England specifically, uh, and particularly London, although some other cities as well, there was a very vibrant stage gladiator scene. And this literally meant that they put up, they erected uh, wooden stages, a bit like the things that they have hangman's nooses on. And fighters would come and do fighting um, displays. Um, and this would involve backsword, quarterstaff, boxing, um, sometimes other weapons like sword and buckler or double swords, this kind of stuff. Um, and they were known as stage gladiators and they fought for money, essentially. 
sometimes to a bleeding head wound, uh, you know, um, so first blood essentially and this kind of thing. And certain people like James Figg became extremely famous because of how successful they were, just like boxers later on. Um, and essentially this scene kind of died out. It kind of died out by the Napoleonic period, so by the late 1700s. Um, and it was it became no more. But it's a fascinating period, and it's a lot of the 18th century British uh, treatises or manuals we have on back sword, small sword, quarter sword, these things come from that culture of stage gladiators. Awesome. Michael Bates says, I remember in your Danax video you said you were still looking for manuscripts and documents <coughs> on their use. Have you found anything else on the topic? I have not, no. Uh, so, so there are no, there are no um, treatises uh, from before I-33 or 133, so which dates to about 1300. So I often get asked about are there any treatises for, you know, Roman fighting or Viking Age fighting. There's nothing before I-33. Um, so therefore the only things we could do to reconstruct or possibly plausibly reconstruct Danax use would be um, descriptive sources from the period, things like um, written accounts from the Battle of Hastings or Icelandic sagas or other, you know, Norse sagas, um, these kind of written sources, artistic sources like the Bayer Tapestry and other art, and then looking at later treatises which deal with similar weapons. But unfortunately, there aren't many similar weapons used in the age of treatises. Um, We've got pole axes, we've got halberds, um, but there's not an awful lot. Um, so it's difficult. And you could argue there's some slightly living lineages. I know if you go to the Czech, uh, Czech Republic or Czechia uh, or Poland, there's some semi-living lineages of the use of the uh, shepherd's axe. Um, but I don't know. Can you really say that's like a Dane axe? I don't really know. Um, I think we're better off using period descriptive accounts. That's probably the most, um, and experimentation, that's probably the, the most surefire way of getting close to it. Excellent. Um, <laughs> when you finish monologuing, I'm never sure what is the word to say, but you know, that was very interesting. Um, here, is, <laughs> here is a question. Who was the better battlefield commander in your opinion, Henry V or Richard the Lionheart? Oh, who was the better battlefield commander? This Deef, uh, Henry V, or Richard the Lionheart? Go, God. So You've this, this is going to be scandalous, and lots of English people might be angry with me for this. Well, they shout boo, and possibly hit. But I'm actually not sure that Henry V was a very good battlefield commander. Um, he was a great leader. And he was a great administrator, but I think he relied heavily on his commanders, on his, his right-hand men. Whereas Richard the Lionheart, it's very clear that when he turned up in the Holy Land, it was, you know, everything had been going quite, as I understand it, quite badly uh, up until that point. Richard the Lionheart t uh, turned up. And really, really shook things up, you know. Um, I I would have to say, based on what I know, and I, I you know, I don't necessarily know vast amounts um, about either. I think that Richard the Lionheart was almost certainly a better commander than Henry V, and uh, I think Henry the uh, Henry V relied on his commanders, and they were the great <laughs> commanders. Whereas Richard the Lionheart, I think, was probably more of a um, lifetime soldier um, than than Henry V was. So, I mean, I think Richard the Lionheart was probably up there with people like like Wellington, essentially. I think he was a real true general. Whereas I don't think Henry V was really a general. I think he was just a good king or an effective king who knew how to use his generals. Whereas I think Richard the Lionheart was actually a general himself. But Richard the Lionheart's a, fan, a, a fascinating topic and, and something he's someone I should research more and maybe do videos about. Definitely, I think people would like that. 
Um, it's an interesting one there. This is I this is <clears> what I've been mulling over while you've been talking, whilst also paying a hundred percent of attention to what you were saying. Um, Marco Tasso says, "I may be interested in starting practicing Hema. Just a real beginner question. After basic training, can you choose the sword you like, i.e., saber, to use from there onwards? Do, do you want to take this or?" Yeah, I, I mean, it depends on what in your club, basically. So the way it works in my club is that the two main weapons that we teach people are longsword in Fiore Delivery's tradition um, and sabre in Hutton and Waits tradition. Um, however, we also teach Fiore's dagger, a little bit of Fiore's wrestling, a little bit of Fiore's spear. So we do do all of Fiore's system, but it's just that most regularly we do longsword Fundamentally, and we don't hide this because that's what most people want to do. Most people come to sword cl- or come to HEMA classes because they want to learn how to use a sword. Um, however, dagger is also super popular once people have done it a couple of times. Um, so those are what we teach as the basic classes. However, once a person in our cl- in our club has graded. Um, which is not a particularly elaborate or complicated affair, but once they've showed that they know the basic curriculum and they are safe um, uh, and trusted to you know, train with steel weapons and they know certain techniques without having to have things overly explained to them like in a beginner class, then they move into the advanced or intermediate class and they can do sparring every week. Now, in the sparring... They can do whatever they like with whatever weapons they like, as long as they're safe, basically. So we literally have people who come and spar week in, week out, just with rapier, or just with sabre, or just with sword and buckler, or just with knife. So yeah, absolutely. If a club is like our club, then usually you have to kind of do whatever the main thing that that club does at the beginning but then once you're sort of in the club and kind of trusted to be safe then you're usually let to go and do something else and most clubs or certainly many clubs i know if you have a particular interest say for example someone came to my club and they they were obsessed with bolognese sword and buckler if they started studying it a lot i'd be like hey look you study that lots you get you kind of get ready to teach it and you can run classes in it because that's great because we can learn from you then and we can add another string to our bow and add another thing that our club is you know and, and this I, is a thing that actually we have you know done yeah. on several occasions with people who've been really interested in one specific thing they've come back and, and they've shared what they've been finding out with everybody else yeah. and it's it's a really good way yeah, to learn. it's happened with several different systems yeah. and, and weapons yeah yeah Absolutely. So it depends on the group, basically, but but most HEMA groups are pretty open-minded because that's sort of the nature of HEMA. That's kind of like, you know, everyone likes the idea of, I don't know, we're quite an individualistic lot, aren't we? We're not, um, I think one of the things that draws people to HEMA is that there's so many different little rabbit holes you can go down and do it your way, essentially. Yeah, I think that's really true. But I, I think yeah, as Matt said, I think most places are happy for you to to, to go off in another direction if you want to. Um, <laughs> Matt would like to answer this question. But I didn't say I wanted to answer. <laughs> Matt, I was just laughing. What would at be it. your Viking name, and which is your favourite Norse god? What would be my Viking name, and uh, <clears throat> what's my favourite Norse god? Well, a favourite Norse god has to hide, and I I was going to say Thor, but actually, actually. Doesn't everyone love Loki? So are you answering the question I, in the context of Marvel? No. no. Although, <laughs> or, although let's face it, you are. <laughs> or, although, or, or, although obviously isn't there some crossover. But, I mean, of course, some of the character yes. traits. Are, so, I mean, Loki. Yeah, You love Loki. I think that I'm probably a little bit of a troll at heart. So I think that Loki's, Loki's my, kind of, uh, my kind of dude. My Viking name, I have... I, I, Make I love that matter Viking so the be- name. Eric Bloodaxe uh, of real Vikings. Eric Bloodaxe. That's Eric the best. Is such a good name. Eric, but and we actually we considered Eric. We nearly as, called as, our as son as a name Eric, for our yes. son. So so it Eric the top. But I couldn't two. say Eric Bloodaxe because that's a real person from history. So I, um, I love the fact that there was a a sword in I think one of the Icelandic sagas called Legbiter, and <laughs> and and I. 
And I love hitting people in the legs in, in sparring. He really So does. I would be Eric Legbiter. <laughs> Eric Legbiter, there we go. And from now on, that is how I shall refer to you <laughs> in front of your parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that Alex? Yeah. Um, so we've got a super chat from Drakinophil. <laughs> who is our lovely friend who we love. He says, who lives in those two terrariums? It's a great question, Alex. In the front terrarium is a thistle mantis. And in the back terrarium is one morning gecko who ended up in that terrarium sort of by mistake. Well, so Lucy is the resident expert here on on, uh, all things that live in If you wanted to go to a reptile channel, then, um, (laughs) you know, we'd move that over somewhere So Lucy, what's your favourite reptile channel? (laughs) What's my favourite reptile? At the moment... It's slightly controversial. My current favourite reptile channel is Green Room Pythons. Green Room Pythons? Yeah, I don't know them. It's not one of the big players is yet. That, is it one person or...? A... It's one person, but he also pretends to be his own brother who's behind the camera. <laughs> it's fucking brilliant. <laughs> That's if you like... He pretends to be reptiles. his own brother. <laughs> and comedians that convincingly pretend to be their own brother. Oh my god, I should so do that. It is so good. Oh, he like puts a hair tie in his beard and wears a hat. It's bloody wonderful. Oh my god. I absolutely love it. Um, so yeah, my current favourite reptile channel is Green Room Pythons. That is absolutely amazing. But yes, Matt has now got a pet morning gecko because I gave <laughs> him a terrarium for his new mantis that I cleared out, which was an old one I used to be using, and I I didn't realise that there must have been eggs in the substrate. Um, and um, yeah, so now the mantis has a different terrarium, uh, and the morning gecko is uh, currently living <laughs> happily. But, but today, by himself, but he loves them. So, but, it's uh, fine. but today I came in this morning, and my mantis, my thistle mantis, I looked in the, I looked in the tank. And I was like, oh my god, there's another mantis <laughs> with my mantis. How on earth did another mantis come get in there? And then Matt I didn't being, know. He's quite new to inverts. I didn't know <laughs> that. When they shed, they literally just pop out of their old skin. And so my mantis was now bigger and was standing ne- or hanging next to its entire skin. Like, that's just an absolutely amazing. It's mind. like a magic. Trick. I was so happy, so excited. Um, but uh, just a brief shout out to some other... You do watch a lot of Snake Discovery Channel. I do. So Lucy's a big fan of Snake Discovery Channel. If you want to do any collabs, then get in contact. <laughs> and... Um, if you want a sword reptile crossover, <laughs> Dave totally Kaufman's down for reptile that. adventures, Dave Wiccan's Kaufman. wicked reptiles. Basically, if you're a channel Clint's, about Clint's uh, reptiles, Clint's reptiles. If you're, if you're a channel all, about reptiles, I watch. As a household, uh, our daughter as well, big fans of all your channels. If any of you <laughs> want to do a collaboration, <laughs> oh, yeah. swords and armor and reptiles, swords and scales, that works. Let's right? mix it all up. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Matt, Matt's an optimist. <laughs> right. So. Thank you, Alex, and we'll go back to military history, which is uh, possibly <coughs> why most of these people. Just, are to, just to warn you, we should wrap up in in five to ten minutes um, because it's getting it's pretty pretty late at this end now. And as you can hear, I'm I'm starting to lose my voice a bit. So, okay, so we've got uh, <coughs> another question here, which is how much. Um, intentional not free sparring unmatched or unequal weapons training do you do at your clubs rapier versus back sword or sword and buckler versus long sword spear versus heater shield what is a heater shield like a knight shield a typical shield shape is often known as a heater shield because it's really? the shape of a, a heater an old iron oh my goodness well you see i've learned something new um <coughs> When I teach, we don't do an awful lot of that at all. Not not in sort of teaching. We, people so, don't sparring, but you might be different. So to answer the question, we do we do do mismatched weapons, um, and it. I, I've over the last few months, I've noticed that we are not doing very much anymore, and I don't know why that's the case because we used to do a lot. We used to do an awful lot of you know saber versus longsword, rapier versus backsword, whatever. We used to do loads of that, um, and for some reason. In the last couple of years, we've started doing less. So uh, I, I think we need to start doing a bit more again. <coughs> so, uh, 
Reaper with no name says, is it possible for new sources from before the age of treatises to be discovered in some museum or private collection somewhere? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, the fact is that the treatises we have have all been preserved by chance. Um, we know treatises that did exist because they're mentioned in other treatises and in other records that are now lost, but they're probably out there somewhere or they might have been destroyed. And undoubtedly, and you know, it, I guess every two or three years, someone finds a treatise that no one knew about that turns up in some archive or library or museum. Um, so yeah, absolutely, new things can turn up all the time. However, do I think that we will find an older treatise than 133 or I 33? I think it's. Of course it's possible, but I think it's relatively unlikely. The reason being that if we look at the Middle East, if we look at Asia, treatises as a concept are something that seem to come about, certainly in Europe and the Middle East um, and the Near East, at about the same time. <clears throat> um, and we, we, we start, to, it's not just treatises for military purposes, but it's also treatises for things like medical and astronomy and things like this. And it's something that comes about not long after the Crusades, essentially. Um, so we have Mamluk treaties from the 14th century. We've got uh, archery treatises from Turkey and again Mamluk, um, uh, sort of 13th, 14th, 15th century. So I don't think... Uh, unless we go back to the Roman era. Now, I do think it's slightly possible, although unlikely, I think it's slightly possible that someone might find something like Vegetius one day that some, somehow gives a little bit more detail about single combat or uh, individual weapon use, should we say, even if it's group combat. Um, I think that uh, maybe even gladiatorial. Um, it's not impossible that in the Roman era, in the Roman Empire... Uh, it's possible that there were treatises or training guides for gladiators. I mean, they had gladius, gladiator schools uh, all over Italy and beyond Italy. Um, so it's possible. Um, but then once, the, with the fall, of the, empire, the fall of the Western Empire, unless there's anything preserved in the Byzantine Empire, which I don't think there is, or we probably would know about it, I think we don't see anything again until after the Crusades. Oh. Wild Hunter says, <coughs> Matt, when are you going to write your treatise? The Matt used to be <coughs> um, In all honesty, I, <laughs> um, I, I suppose probably 10 years ago, I arrogantly thought that I could write training guides or manuals of sorts. And the more I learn, the less equipped I feel to do it. Um, that's a sign that you're probably in a better position to actually do it. Also, you're really good at drawing. You could draw the little man. Yeah, but I, I, I just I don't feel that I'm accomplished enough or experienced enough to, to do that. I, other people can do that. Um, and, you know, I think, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't feel that I'm qualified to. And, and I think that the existing historical treatises exceed anything. They are better than anything I could write, so... John Gus says, I was fascinated by your recent video featuring the bill, yet some forms are perplexing with respect to techniques. Can we look forward to a follow-up video on that topic? Um, yeah, I mean, so funnily enough, we do actually have one treatise showing or describing the use of the bill, and that's the so-called anonymous Bolognese source. Um from about 1500, so it uh, could be a little bit later than that. So it is from the time of the Mary Rose bills. It's Tudor, essentially, by British standards. Um, and the, the bill use is not particularly complicated. It's essentially like Polax use. Um, and funnily enough, if you look at... Sorry, no, I, I misspoke. The bill is in Antonio Mancellino from 1531. But the Polax is in Anonimo, is in the Anonymous Bolognese. And what's interesting is if you look at the techniques between the Anonimo Bolognese and, and Antonio Manciolino, which is also Bolognese, 
they're of a similar date, the techniques for the pole axe and the techniques for the bill are very, very similar. So, um, I think that basically, with some changes for the length of the weapon and the fact that you don't have a spike on the back of the bill usually, uh, you can actually use everything we know about the, the pole axe and the halberd and the bill to use with the bill um, very effectively. I think we're probably on the last couple of questions now because my voice is going. Your voice is going. I've been, been talking for uh, more than two hours, <coughs> which is a lot even for me. I found another question and I highlighted it and then I got distracted by people being funny. So hang on <laughs> a second and I will find it. Eric Bluntax. <laughs> it was a... It was... Hang on. Andrew Sock thinks I should be called Eric Bluntax. There was a cool question about which someone asked and do forgive me because I'm now going to completely bastardise your question but it was something to do with um, why do you think that... Um, Pointy things are more popular than blunt things it's like there. maces. A. Why do you think the blunt weapons like maces and hammers are less popular than swords and axes? Um, fundamentally, <laughs> certainly if we look at the medieval period, um, the blunt weapons are predominantly anti-armour weapons, but they're also anti-armour, but they're for use by people in armour. Um, Sharp weapons are easier to offend someone who's unarmoured um, and quicker, usually, um, because of their point of balance. So, f yeah, fundamentally, I think it's, you know, I, I mean, I've made this point before about how sword versus mace, for example, in a civilian environment, a sword is, it's difficult to grab because it's got edges on it. It's very easy to wound someone in all sorts of ways, thrusting, chopping, slicing with a pull, slicing with a push. Um, you know, it just it's very easy to wound someone with a sword, it's like a big knife. Whereas with a mace, you've got to just hit someone really hard. And if you don't hit them in the head, if you just hit them in the arm, yeah, you might break their arm, but they're not gonna usually die from a broken arm. Whereas you hit someone in the arm with a sword, they might die from blood loss. Um, so fundamentally, unarmoured people are at far greater risk, on average, I would say, from things like swords or knives than they are from a truncheon. Hence the police use truncheons, uh, at least in this country. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. Some maces are blunt, but some maces aren't blunt. Yeah, when some maces, are, yeah, that. you can have a, smite, a spiked mace, yeah. of course, which is somewhere middle ground. But at the end of the day, top heavy weapons mm. are hard hitting, but also more cumbersome. Um, so you, you know, and they're not very good in defense. If you've only got a mace, if you don't have a shield and you don't have armor, and someone's attacking you with a sword, and you're just trying to defend yourself with the mace, the mace is really quite slow. Uh, and the person with the sword it can just outspeed you. I mean, they can, you know, they can cut multiple times. You're going to be struggling to keep up with an axe or a mace. So fundamentally, in an unarmoured or a lightly armoured situation, the person with the sword's going to have the advantage in general. They've got more options. But the other person and... might have a mace, which would be cool. Yeah, and oh, and the other thing I was going to mention, of course, Pre-swords, it's a whole different scenario because if we go back to ancient Egypt or, you know, I don't know, prehistory, a stone-headed mace or a stone battle axe, a st you know, a stone-headed axe, or indeed a bronze-headed axe, might be all you've got as a hand weapon. So, yeah, you've got a spear or a bow and then you've got a short mace as a backup um, because swords don't exist yet or you don't have access to them because a bronze sword is a very expensive and difficult to make thing. Uh, Stone-headed mace is a relatively easy thing to make. Um, you've got a very a... nice, yeah it was a good explanation, <laughs> um, you've got a very nice super chat here from Luna Corvus that says I don't have any questions particularly interesting at this moment just some support for my favourite historical weapon military history channel. Thanks, Luna. We're, we're also <laughs> very happy if you have questions that aren't particularly interesting. Matt is in equal opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Interesting you know. or boring questions. Also, so few questions are actually boring. 
like oh, personal oh, oh, interests. Yeah, all um, interesting is a subjective thing. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of my rambles and a lot of my videos are not very interesting to most people, but hopefully but you're here. they're interesting to some of you, yeah. Because we like that sort of thing. Um, ooh, how can you make money out of a history degree? Time team. No, that's not a thing anymore. Well, you know, I, I guess... I time team. How can you make money out of a history degree? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm sort of demonstrating it here, aren't I? Given that I have a history history degree. Start a YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> one, yeah. of, one of the many ways. Yeah. Or, history you know, lecturer. Or who's, who's earning more money than me with their history degrees? People like Dan Jones or... Uh, Susanna Lipscomb, Lipscomb, you know, become a professional academic, sell best-selling books and get a few TV series and uh, uh, interviews uh, and that will give you a very good uh, living, I would think. Unfortunately, so I, when I was younger, I always wanted to be a museum curator, which is a very difficult uh, s uh, field to get into. And... Um, not only is it difficult to get into, but it doesn't pay very well either. So, you know, it's really, really difficult. Um, Time Team is back on YouTube with new digs. Yeah, I did, I did know that. You yeah. didn't tell me. Yeah, I'm sure I did. I wasted all this time watching reptiles. <laughs> Oh my God! Some of my uh, some of my friends have, have have been on Time Team over the years, and uh, uh, shout out to Raksha if you ever watch this. If you know Raksha from Time Team, she's an old uni mate of mine. Um, we've um, drunk together many a time. Don't ruin her reputation. <laughs> no, I won't say any more than that. Um, so Luna has come back with a question: Do people in the Middle Age carry short, blunt weapons as sidearms? Yes. Uh, so short maces were sometimes carried as, as sidearms, and we see this in uh, 15th and 16th century art. Time to um, and, you know, I think that maces were ob obviously cheaper than, uh, than swords. And interestingly, we, in the modern world, certainly in Britain, we associate truncheons with the police uh, because they are less than lethal. I won't say non-lethal, less than lethal weapons. Um, and we know that... Uh, the medieval aldermen, uh, as we called them in this country, they carried maces instead of swords because if you caught a house burglar or a, or a shop thief or something, you could whack them with a mace and cut them off to prison, um, which was seen as the good Christian thing to do rather than <laughs> chopping, their, chopping their limbs off with a sword. I can't believe Time Team is back and you didn't tell me. Yeah, Time Team's is, back that online. That is the most exciting news. Of yeah, the and, and, and um, that is so cool. Hippocrap, what a great name! Hippocrap <laughs> says. Uh, Hippocrap seems like Tony so Robinson bad. back for some special. That's specials, so exciting! I'm really, really. That's happy really to hear good. That. Yeah, Thank you guys. no, it's brilliant. And you know, I, I, <laughs> when you're an archaeologist, you will encounter lots of different opinions about Time Team. I remember back in the day in the nineties, the there were lots ones of are wrong. there were lots of old school archaeologists who really looked down on Time Team. But do you know what? All of the archaeology students that I knew all watched it, and most of them were there doing archaeology degrees because of Time Team. Um, so you know, university archaeology courses were flooded with students thanks to Time Team. And this is something that I encountered when I started doing videos on YouTube. A lot of academics looked down their nose at it, but frankly, how are you going to educate these days? How are you going to get history out to? thousands or potentially millions of people and make history interesting and popular to people you use mass appeal platforms like YouTube or um, or you know TikTok or whatever um, you've got to move with the times uh, and if you don't move with the times you get left behind and you become part of history instead of making history interesting and popular Sarah McCarthy agrees with me about reptile channels being good <laughs> which makes me really happy. But if any of you out there, lots of if any of you out there have a particularly unusual or interesting pet, reptiles, invertebrates, whatever, uh, post in the comments. We've got about five minutes left. Post in the comments. What what interesting pets have you got? <laughs> How historical are they? Um, I can see the ghost hero is talking about Graham Hancock, but I've missed the discussion up. up yeah, to the I missed the top discussion. But I'm I not going to talk about Graham Hancock. I think Hancock that that now. could be a whole separate. Do you know what? Episode. I will talk. Having said no, that, I don't, don't. Know, no, I will mention Graham Hancock. 
So, no. so I got some applause and some hate for my Graham Hancock rant videos. But do you know what? I freaking love Graham Hancock's books. Purely as entertainment, they are really good reads. I love them. I watched The X-Files growing up. I love a bit of conspiracy theory, wacky kind of, you know, um, uh, ancient aliens type stuff for entertainment. The danger is when people confuse real archaeology and real history and real re research with someone getting stoned and coming up with some wacky ideas. And yeah, sometimes you need people to have some wacky ideas to push forward uh, people's theories. Great. I'm not necessarily against that. But it's just you've just got to kind of, you know, I don't know. Be honest, I guess, about what your what source material you're using and what are the degrees of plausibility involved here. Okay, we've got um, a nice question from Copy Left Claim. Hey Matt, in an unarmoured dueling context with long swords, is it better to have the heavier sword or the lighter sword? Oh, uh, in an unarmoured context. In an unarmoured duel with a long sword, would you like the lighter one or the heavier one? <sighs> Is your opponent? It depends how heavy and how light. Or weak. <laughs> so yeah, does you know if your if your sword weighs weighs like twenty kilograms, that's clearly too heavy, and you're gonna lose. Um, in general, in an unarmored fight, I would say the lighter one, but it depends. You can go too light. I mean, obviously, it can be flimsy, and it becomes difficult to parry at heavier blows uh, with a very light sword. So. I would say what you want probably is a kind of an average longsword for your build and size. But it's better to be on the lighter side of that than the heavier side. Because fundamentally in an unarmoured duel, speed is paramount. You know, if you chop into someone's shoulder or if you chop entirely through their torso, they're going to be out of the fight most of the time no. either way. So, so it's... Who hits first and doesn't get hit back? In other words, being able to hit first and then parry their afterblow or, or parry and then riposte quickly is worth more than, you know, pure power. Right. Joe has last, a Jack Russell. Last, <laughs> that is a I great dog. I think we're going to have to do last, last question now. Oh... Can I just read what people have said about their pets? Oh, yeah, yeah. Pets, pets, pets. There's some good pets here. I have a wild bunny. A wild bunny? <laughs> and it's in the margins of manuscripts. Only <laughs> <laughs> um, well, if you have it, doesn't it cease to be a wild bunny? But anyway. Raven's Beach Jack Russell. says, I have a Russian tortoise and he tries to bite me. My I'm cat Russian. and everyone on the toes. His name is Turbo. That is awesome. What's Great a there. Russian tortoise and how's that different to another? So there is another name for a Russian tortoise that is... Oh. Because Russian tortoises aren't actually from Russia, I think. <laughs> right. But yes... Um, yeah, no, that's really cool. Portuguese man of war, isn't that a jellyfish? <laughs> yes, it's not true. No, I really want that to be true. <laughs> but Jack Russell is a very good... Oh, okay, so my good fellow reptile person, Sarah McCarthy, has three royal pythons, Whoa. a boa constrictor, a carpet python, three beardies, three leopard geckos, bull snake, Texas rat snake, Russian tortoise, Aki monitor, 52 tarantulas, what? two scorpions, two mensas, two cats, and a dog. So oh I really gosh. want a Brazilian black tarantula. I think they're the prettiest tarantulas in the world. My whole family is not on board with this as a plan. Well, I don't um, really care. I, I'm indifferent to tarantulas. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I don't dislike them. I'm just they, they just yeah. don't do anything for me personally. We need but a royal python. Um, yeah, my son things. is desperate for a carpet python, but I don't think that we have the space for a carpet python. Also, they're quite tenacious, and he's three. Um, we've got a lot of geckos and a lot of different frogs. And um, Can I just say, Lord yeah, Seth Taggart cool. has a pot-bellied pig. Or had a pot-bellied pig. <gasps> Amazing. That's awesome. Oh, cute. <laughs> An old gerbil. Yeah, oh, my daughter's no. got gerbils. They are so much fun. A partridge in a pear tree. Pet kids, we've got them too. <laughs> Definitely the highest maintenance of the creatures so that live in the Lu house. Luna Corvus says my dream reptile would be a hawk or falcon. I would you love are, a bird yeah. of prey. And actually that's on my bucket list. Is um, There's a place not far from us that actually does falconry uh, courses and experiences and stuff. And I'd love, I'd absolutely love to, to do some falconry. That would be really good. Because cool, I've always, I've, like my entire life, I, you know, whenever we're in the car driving, I'm like, there's a buzzard! 
There's a red kite. There's a kestrel. I'm, I've always been, uh, I won't say obsessed, but I've always been very excited by birds of prey. Yeah. Right. Yeah, cool stuff. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been great having you here. Lovely having some great questions. Thanks again to Zach Evans uh, for hosting me on his channel for the stream before this. If you didn't see that, you can go to Zach's um, channel. If you go on our Facebook page, you'll see there's a link there uh, to his uh, stream and it's recorded so you can go and watch it. Is and that how many hosting. people have watched this? Uh, that's how many views there have been. But, well, yeah, we've had, so we've had about oh, two... Thanks. Yeah, thanks for joining us. We've had, him. We've had about he likes you. Two, we've had about maximum two hundred viewers at a time nice. for this uh, live stream, and we've had twelve hundred, nearly thirteen hundred uh, views at this point. So thank you so much. Thank you, obviously, to all the super chats, um, much appreciated. But also thank you to everybody else who asked questions as well. You asked so many questions, and I spoke so much that I've pretty much lost my voice. So you might not be getting a video tomorrow. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, but we'll see you again soon. We'll try not to leave it uh, so long until the next live stream now. Okay? So bye-bye from me and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. <laughs> <laughs> I like the two runners, but not quite. But just not the yeah. timing. <laughs> Thanks for watching bye. and we'll see you again soon. Cheers, folks. You should say like.